Okay, let's read one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. Now, some people pronounce this book one way, some pronounce it another way. I call it Malachi, although some Christians pronounce his name Malachi. Okay, doesn't matter. Let's spend some time together, you, me, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible, and have a great time. As usual, I have my microphone in front of my face. It covers up most of the Bible. Let's just read it the best I can. <laughs> okay, here we go. Malachi chapter 1. This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi. And the name Malachi means my messenger. The Lord's love for Israel. Verse 2. I have always loved you, says the Lord. But you retort, really? How have you, show, how have you loved us? And the Lord replies, this is how I showed my love for you. I loved your ancestor Jacob, but I rejected his brother Esau and devastated his hill country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert for jackals. Verse 4, Esau's descendants in Edom may say, we have been shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. But the Lord of heaven's armies replies, and I want to stop there because one of the names for Jesus is the Lord of heaven's armies, in case you didn't know that. That's one of his titles. So, does that mean Jesus is speaking here? Maybe yes, and maybe no. We have to get discernment from God on who is actually speaking here, the Father or the Son. If I could please give you my opinion, I think this is Jesus speaking here uh, in most of the entire book, the book of Malachi. But the Lord of heaven's armies replies, it's probably Jesus, they may try to rebuild, but I will demolish them again. Their country will be known as the land of wickedness, and their people will be called the people with whom the Lord is forever angry. Now that sounds kind of scary. We don't want God nor his Christ to be forever angry with us. Amen. Verse 5, when you see the destruction for yourselves, you will say, truly the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. Now, in the year 2017, right now, we're learning that God's greatness goes throughout the entire universe. But two or 3,000 years ago, God was using stories like this and books like Malachi chapter 1 to teach the Jewish nation that he's bigger than the nation of Israel, that he's greater and bigger than the nation of Israel. He's been teaching them very slowly since day one of creation. Verse 6, the Lord of heaven's armies says to the priests, a son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? Verse 7, I believe Jesus says, you have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Now there is a key word altar right there. 
That states that this can also be God the Father speaking. How can we know? By looking for key words like that and asking God who's speaking here. And I believe God just told me that Jesus is speaking here. Then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Can you imagine if you tried to give a moldy chicken sandwich to your boss? What would your boss say? Or if you went to church and passed out moldy, Rod and apples to the church members, what would they say? This is what the Jewish people were doing to God's son um, on the altar. They were offering terrible, filthy sacrifices that God would not accept. Verse 9, go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring that kind of offering... Why should he show any favor at all? Asked the Lord of heaven's armies. That's an interesting sentence there. That could be Jesus and God in the same sentence. What I mean is, that could be Jesus speaking, talking about his dad. I'm saying that's possibly what's going on there. Um, that was in verse 9. <clears throat> Let's continue. Verse 10, look at what, I believe it's Jesus, it can be the Father, look at what Jesus says here, how I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. Do you know that Jesus says that to many churches all over the world? Churches who are stealing money from their members, churches who are teaching demonic doctrines to the members, churches who actually have sexual innuendo happening with their members. This is what Jesus says to the churches who are doing these kinds of things. How I wish one of you would shut the church doors so that these worthless innuendos, these worthless principles that you're preaching, these worthless ways that you steal money from your congregation would be ended. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. He is the Lord of the army. He is the one we have to fear because he controls the army. Then he says, and I will not accept your offerings. Do you know one night I went to go worship? This is when I was living down at the beach. And one night I put on some music and went to worship. And God would not accept it. That, that right there is possibly the only time that has ever happened to me. He would not accept my worship. There was a wall up, a spiritual wall. Verse 11, but my name is honored by people of other nations from morning till night. That sentence right there is one of the reasons why this is one of my favorite books. God is teaching us children, uh, Jew, my, my Jewish children, he's talking to the Jews. My name is famous throughout the whole world, not just to you. My name is being honored by many other countries, not just Israel. Sweet incense and pure offerings 
are being offered to me all over the world, not just in Israel, but you didn't know that. You see, you Jewish people, you thought you were the only ones who knew about me, but now through the prophet Malachi, I am teaching you and the world something brand new, that there are people all over the world who are worshiping me and following me and offering wonderful things to me. To continue, for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 12, but you dishonor my name with your actions by bringing contemptible food. You are saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord. And you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord's of heaven's armies. The Lord, I'm sorry, no S. Think of it. Animals that are stolen and crippled and sick are being presented as offerings. Should I accept from you such offerings as these? Ask the Lord. Right there, he didn't use the title, the Lord of Heaven's Armies. Instead, he said, the Lord. I find that interesting. Could that be the Father there? Verse 14. Cursed is the cheat who promises to give a fine ram from his flock, but then sacrifices a defective one to the Lord. Let me explain why that is such a big deal. Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. And he's symbolized in the Old Testament through a perfect Lamb or a perfect Ram. When the Jewish people were giving a faulty Lamb, a imperfect Ram, a Ram with problems and blemishes and he's sick that would be like a sick person dying on the cross a problem person a sinful person a dirty person dying on the cross for us that is why this is so offensive God says for I am a great king says the Lord of heaven's armies and my name is feared among the nations. Listen to that. We're learning that all of the nations know about God and they fear him, not just the Jewish nation. I find that very interesting. Malachi chapter 2. I believe it's Jesus. Listen, you priests, this command is for you. Listen to me and make up your minds to honor my name, says the Lord of heaven's armies, or I will bring a terrible curse against you. Did you notice how Jesus didn't mention Satan nor the demons? Jesus said, I will bring a terrible curse against you. Are you starting to trust Tears to Joy Ministries a little bit more now? All right, I will curse even the blessings you receive. Indeed, I have already cursed them. Do you see that's God speaking or his son Jesus? They bring the curses, not Satan. I have already cursed them because you have not taken my warning to heart. I will punish your descendants and splatter your faces with the manure from your festival sacrifices. Look at the way Jesus is talking. And I will throw you on the manure pile. Do you know there are many Christians who say Jesus doesn't do this? They will say that Jesus would never do this. They will argue with me. 
They will unfriend me. They will say bad things about me. They will gossip about me because I share with you what God does. Here, we have God or his son, Jesus. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Jesus is also deity. Both of them are deity, the father and the son. I've been telling you God does this. I've been telling you and telling you. Verse 4, then at last you will know it was I who sent you this warning so that my covenant with the Levites can continue, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 5, the purpose of my covenant with the Levites was to bring life and peace. And that is what I gave them. This required reverence from them. Do you see? We have to fear God or the system doesn't work. The system that God put in place doesn't work as well when we don't fear him with a reverent fear. We have to fear God. And guess what? God is going to make sure we have a reverent fear for him you better believe it. To continue, this required reverence from them. That's a reverent fear. And they greatly revered me and stood in awe of my name. They passed on to the people the truth of the instructions they received from me. They did not lie or cheat. They walked with me living good and righteous lives, and they turned many from lives of sin. Verse 7, the words of a priest's lips should preserve knowledge of God. Let's stop right there. I have multiple videos warning you brand new Christians you should not be teaching if you don't study, you should not be teaching. If you aren't seeking out God, asking for more knowledge, trying to find the truth, and willing to admit when you're wrong the way that I do, you should not be teaching. I'm warning all of you, you're cursing yourself by teaching bad doctrines. The words of a priest's lips should preserve knowledge of God and people should go to him for instruction. For the priest is the messenger of the Lord of heaven's armies. But you priests have left God's paths. Do you know we have brand new Christians all over the internet putting up teaching videos? We have brand new Christians who haven't even read the Bible one time all the way through, putting up teaching videos. This end time is so cursed. God has given us babies to teach us, and this is what is happening to the Jewish nation in the final book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Listen to what Jesus says. Your instructions have caused many to stumble into sin. You have corrupted the covenant I made with the Levites, says the Lord of heaven's armies. That's one of the titles for Jesus. <coughs> so I have made you despised and humiliated in the eyes of all the people. Isn't that exactly what God has done to Christians right now? We are despised all over the world, and people laugh at us all over the world. Why? Because we're doing the same things in chapter 2 here that the Jewish people were doing. People laugh at us all over the world. To continue, for you have not obeyed me, but have shown favoritism in the way you carry out my instructions. Verse 10. A call to faithfulness. This is a great section of the Bible. This is just fantastic. 
Are we not all children of the same father? Are we not all created by the same God? You see, I believe that's Jesus talking about his dad. If you dissect the sentence carefully, he's actually talking about his dad here. Then why do we betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors? Judah has been unfaithful, and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. The men of Judah, he's singling out the men now, have defiled the Lord's beloved sanctuary by marrying women who worship idols. May the Lord cut off from the nation of Israel every last man who has done this and yet brings an offering to the Lord of heaven's armies. You see, we can bring offerings to Jesus now from our heart and our soul. We can. Now chapter 2 gets really good. Let's go to verse 13. Here is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure, you cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. You see, when you got married, this was a big, 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 big deal in the spirit realm. And it's a big deal to God. In fact, marrying someone is one of the biggest, most important things you can do here on earth because it has so much spiritual consequences to it. Okay, look, we can't go into that because uh, <laughs> this is about Malachi. Let's continue though. Jesus isn't paying attention to their prayers or their worship. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her. Here we have Jesus singling out the men. You have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner the wife of your marriage vows. Committing adultery is a huge, huge deal. Don't believe me? Listen to this. Verse 15. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? You see, when you get married, you become one with your spouse. In body, and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. You see, children of God, the main purpose of getting married is not to have sex. It's to have godly, wonderful children that you are going to raise properly from day one to fear the Lord. That is the purpose of marriage. Verse 16, look at what Jesus says. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. That could be the Father possibly speaking there. By the way, in case you didn't know, there are some Bible books and some sections where God and his son Jesus take turns talking back and forth, back and forth in the Bible. Look at what he says now. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Now do you see one of the reasons why this book is so incredible? I tell you the truth, 
you could write a 500 page book just on Malachi chapter 2. You really could. Let's continue. Verse 17 You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? Let me explain to you how we Christians do that right now. When we say to each other, God always blesses the non-believers with more money than us, or, I've noticed that the non-believers have wives and husbands and children and they get to have sex and they have businesses and we don't. You're wearing God with those evil words. You really are. I've done the same too and we have to try not to talk that way anymore because we are the ones super blessed, not them. We are. Malachi chapter 3, the coming day of judgment. Now, Malachi 3 1 is definitely Jesus speaking. So, if any Muslims, occultists, non believers, or your family members and friends ask you, I don't believe Jesus speaks in the Old Testament, can you show me one place? Show them Malachi 3 1. Let's read it. This is the Son of God talking. Look, I am sending my messenger. He's talking about John the Baptist there. And he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. This was fulfilled in the New Testament when Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey, going into the temple or possibly fulfilled at other times when Jesus went to the temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly, is surely coming. Here we got prophecy about God's Son coming to earth. Says the Lord of heaven's armies. There we got that title for Jesus again. Verse 2. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Nobody. Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? Nobody. You see, Jesus is so holy that when he came to earth, he's about to tell you about the situation. To continue, Jesus says, For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they, want, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Now, how did Jesus do all of that? A lot of that was done physically when he was a man by the words he was speaking and the supernatural that was happening to people while Jesus was speaking. A lot of this happened, I believe, after he died and God put him in charge of heaven and earth and he's working in his chosen ones, starting with Mary and Peter and the early, early first disciples. It's very cool, very interesting. Now, verse 4, Then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem as he did in the past. The people there are chosen ones worldwide. That's symbolism right there. Verse 5, at that time, I will put you on trial. Now he's talking about the non-chosen ones. 
Look at what he says to them. This is terrifying. Jesus says to the non-chosen ones, I am eager to witness against all sorcerers and adulterers and liars. Do you see how big of a deal it is to cheat on your wife now? Do you see that the witches and warlocks who are non-chosen have coming to them? This is terrifying. Jesus says, I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages. Do you see how our Lord is? He even cares when our bosses cheat us on our paychecks. I've been cheated before, many times. You've been cheated by bosses, most likely. Jesus cares. I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages, who oppress widows and orphans, or who deprive the foreigners living among you of justice. For these people do not fear me. Do you see how important it is, everyone, to fear God? It is vitally, vitally important we fear God says the Lord of heaven's armies. Okay, verse 6, a call to repentance. Hmm, that sounds good. I am the Lord and I do not change. That is a famous scripture in the Bible. Write down Malachi 3, 6. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, most likely Jesus. But in fact, I think Jesus is speaking for sure in the entire chapter 3, by the way. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you, God? I added God there, of course. You have cheated me of the tithes and the offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all of the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the window of heaven for you. Let's stop right there. Jesus is not concerned about money here. Jesus is concerned about the poor people having food to eat, about the widows, their husbands died, They went off to war and they died. He's concerned about the widows having food and and clothing. He's concerned about the orphans when when the mom and dad died in warfare, died in other ways, and the little children. He's concerned about them having food. He's not concerned about money here. Another point I want to make is, Jesus says in verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. I want you to know the storehouse was separate from the temple. That is so important. Because when churches try to use this scripture to tell you that you have to give them money, I want you to know this is terrible symbolism. The Jewish people were not bringing money into the temple per se, They were bringing money and items to the storehouse, which is outside of the temple. There is no more tithing in the New Testament. And churches who use the scripture have no idea what they're even talking about. The storehouse would be outside of the church, like a collection pool. Let's continue. Jesus says, if you would do this, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. 
He's not talking about giving churches money here. He's talking about you and I helping the homeless, helping our family members, helping our best friends who don't have any food. He's talking about us helping cancer patients and orphans and going to children's hospitals and bringing them a stuffed animal. That's what he's talking about. Verse 11, Jesus says, Your crops will be abundant, for for I will guard them from insects and disease. That's correct. No fly, no bee, no ant can move a single inch unless Jesus gives permission. Not even one inch. Jesus says, Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? Verse 14, you have said, What's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed for those who do evil get rich and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. Christians do that all the time too. They repeat those bad sentences there all the time. Verse 16, the Lord's promise of mercy. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. You see, God is listening to you every single microsecond. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. Did you know God is watching our imagination 24-7? Every single microsecond, God is watching the pictures that come into our mind and heart. Verse 17, They will be my people, That is a prophecy about the chosen ones in our time too. Says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. He's talking there about the chosen ones too. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. There he's talking about the chosen ones and the non-chosen ones and how we're going to see the difference between them. (coughs) Excuse me. By the way, I've been under demonic attack almost for the entire Bible reading uh, with, with my chest and my throat. But Malachi chapter 4, the coming day of judgment. The Lord of heaven's army says, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked, those are the non-believers, will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. The best symbolism to be used for that is he's talking about when they get judged at the great white throne of judgment and they get thrown into hell. Verse 2, but you, I'm sorry, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, will rise with healing in his wings 
and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Do you know what I believe Jesus is talking about there? I think there's a possibility we're going to be at the great white throne of judgment watching the non-chosen ones as they scream and cry in terror as they get judged by Jesus and escorted to hell and the lake of fire. I think we're going to be standing there watching. Now with that being said, let me read verse 2 again. But for you, my chosen ones who fear my name, the Son of God will rise with his healing wings in your lives, my chosen ones, and you get to go free. You will be leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture because you will not go to the lake of fire. Verse 3, On the day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 4, Jesus is about to say goodbye for the book of Malachi. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant. What does that mean? Remember, this is the last book in the Old Testament. Jesus had not come to earth yet and die on the cross, so they were still supposed to follow the law. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Verse 5, look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. Most people believe he's talking about John the Baptist there. Verse 6, his preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. That's, Malachi, that's the book of Malachi. You can see how beautiful that is. He talks to the priests. He talks about marriage and divorce. He talks about bosses cheating their employees. He talks about people who lie. John the Baptist is in the book in prophecy. Jesus, the Son of God, is speaking all over the entire book, especially chapter 3. This is an amazing book. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for spending this time with me. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you, and praise God for you.